Manager of Sustainability for EMCO. We want to thank you to, to, for joining the first of our three-part webinar series around um, shaping the future of a sustainable mobility. And I want to just ask everybody, if you have questions, please type them in the chat and we'll have time at the end of the presentation to go through all your questions. And then I'm going to turn it over to Adam, who's going to be your presenter today. Adam? So first and foremost, I just wanted to thank everybody for your time, uh, the energy and the effort to join this call. Uh, it's through events like this and the collaborative effort and the collaborative spirit that we get to generate a transformative understanding. So the reason why I bring up transformative, it's important when we all look at applications, whether it's from the mobility market space to other industries that we all focus on, we have to start first with a transformative approach. And it's in these events that we develop this transformative ideology in which we can start to think outside of the box. And it's with this outside of the box thinking that we develop solutions and new pathways to move forward. So first and foremost, before we get moving, you know, we wanna throw out a legal disclaimer just so that everyone know, knows that the information that we're presenting to our best of our knowledge is factual and truthful. That being said, with the sustainability market space, things move so quickly. And so what we mean by moving quickly, it's not a monthly or annual yearly thing. It's minute by minute we're seeing changes in this market space. So it's with this that we're putting together these types of educational resources so that you as a consumer, designer, specifier, brand owner could make independent decisions on how to move forward in choosing the right technologies for your systems. So with that, this is just an introduction. You can, you've seen our faces, but again, uh, myself, Adam Wozniak, uh, I'm the Senior Manager of Sustainability for Amco Polymers. I'm coming to you guys today with more than 23 years knowledge in the market space. So I'm not coming to you as a academic specialist. I'm coming to you as an individual that's served in many roles. I've served in your roles. I've served in customer service. I've worked on the production floors. I've worked in product development. I've worked on molecular development. I've worked on uh, sales. Uh, I've been active in the field. So in that, we as an organization have specialists that are involved solely in these specific fields. So myself, 100% of my time is focused on sustainability for AMCO. Uh, Bruce, 100% of his time is focused on fo the mobility market space and, and growth development. And just as there's Bob as well, Robert, where he's focused on uh, sustainability uh, growing or growing the market segment for the mobility market space as well. So not only are we, we, we have the titles, but we've actively served in these roles and we've been in multiple industry positions over the years so that when we're discussing these technologies, we're taking a look at this from all angles, not only from a producer perspective to a designer, from a integrator, from a molder to an extruder, we look at all of these different segments and it's with that that we bring industry knowledge to where you guys can implement these technologies into your daily lives. With this video, this is more or less an introduction of who we are and what we are. So one thing that I want to make a point of is that when we talk about carbon footprint, there's a reason why we're focused on a smaller footprint. I myself, as well as many others on this call, we all have family members. And what our concerns are moving forward is that we need to be committed to developing a smaller footprint for our children, our children's children, our, our loved ones, our family members. So no, not only do we take into account the materials that we produce and generate and help specify, but our goal is to support your goals so that future generations can have a better lifestyle, can have a better environment, can have a, a, 
a, a greener world as a whole. So, you know, this is the context because we care. With this, we, we give a sustainability pledge. And, you know, sustainability has been part of our DNA and a large part of what we do and who we are since 1961 for our parent company, Rivago. For AMCO, which actually stands for Arthur Metzger Corporation, you know, we started in 1955. In both our organizations, we fit synergistically within each other, largely because the fundamental basis of our business has been focused on taking products that have been part of a waste stream and regenerating them back into a useful uh, material or a useful additive that can go into a product so that we can move forward. So our pledge as an organization is to give back to the world what it's given to us. So giving a second life is really how it all started for the organization. And, you know, today as one of the leading plastics recyclers and one of the leaders in the market space, we continue to push the boundaries in recycling technologies and applications. Reverting back to that video intro, you know, one thing I want everyone to hang on to is that we want to shape the market space. So not only do we want to participate, not only do we want to react to trends and things that are happening, but we as an organization need to be strong enough to where we can put our foot forward and actually shape that market space. So what do we mean by shaping? You know, good example I can give you guys is that, you know, I started drinking coffee three years ago. I was late in life jumping onto that trend. And walking into a Starbucks, it was very difficult to understand the menu. I mean, just trying to order a plain black coffee can be very daunting and can be very nerve wracking. So what we as an industry leader have to do and strive to do is to start to shape that menu. And that menu starts with the fundamental technologies of which we utilized for sustainable technologies. So as a whole, we need to refine it. We need to define it. And we need to give you guys a path moving forward. So this is how we're developing these pathways. So again, through advancements, you know, we can recycle more types of plastics, you know, from post-consumer all the way to advanced molecular recycling. And we're going to work together as a team in solving plastic waste issues in the market space and making things truly circular. You know, again, that word circular is very synonymous today with sustainability. And it's in this that we as an organization at Amco Polymers have brick and mortar assets that can assist you in reclaiming materials that are wasted in your process or reclaiming parts that have reached end of life in the consumer life. These things are where we have to put the investments moving forward so that we can capture these goods before they reach the landfill. Let's move forward to the next slide. So some examples of what we have, and, and again, these are these are much broader than what we what we truly have to offer. But you know, giving you some of the prime examples of where we started and the fundamental purposes of how we've joined in the sustainability efforts. You know, the, the carpet market space, carpet fiber from a post-industrial standpoint to waste carpet, we have invested significantly over the years in recapturing this waste stream of product segregating it into an olefin and into a polyamide base and using this for repurpose into applications from varying market spaces from mobility to electrical electronic to consumer goods similarly we are actively involved in the nylon fiber market space that are in used fishing nets so used fishing nets not only from fish farms but we also work with local communities local fishermen to reclaim those nets that have been used and are going into the waste streams so we have a Hylon Ocean product portfolio that we can actively offer to this market space in which we use 100% sourced ocean derived feedstocks from nylon fibers that are used in fishing nets. Beyond that, working with post industrial scraps, we use different post consumer waste streams in our compound formulations. So through caps and closures, end of life crates, uh, any main ingredient that's used in recycled polyethylene compounds. You know, despite the difficulties that are posed with these materials, we continue to work on technologies to help deliver consistent quality for our customers' demands. As always, we're continuing to work on our environmental footprint. So, you know, in a world where we're actively involved in natural disasters, I'm sure everyone's kind of on pins and needles because hurricane season's coming. And a lot of that has been impacted largely by our footprint into the world itself. So we as an organization measure our carbon footprint. We're working on technologies to deliver carbon footprint on our products from cradle to gate. Uh, from the beginning of life cycle to the end of life cycle. We're continuing to optimize these processes and we look forward to sharing this information with you as we get conclusive information. Together with our employees, we continue to initiate efforts to improve the market space and the environments that we work in. So we understand that the decisions that we make today have an impact not only on ourselves, on our children, and in the environments that we work within. 
So as an example of what we do to continue to reduce our environmental footprints, Rivago, our parent company, has built into the, the Greece infrastructure in Volos, Greece, the, the largest and most modern biomass power plant. And it's through that investment that we're able to give back to the communities as a whole. But this particular biomass plant has the ability to power the entire industrial zone in Volos. So it's with that that we're making these efforts to help with our scope emissions. Uh, we're investing in solar panels around the facilities that we operate in because we need to operate with clean energies. And the overall goal is to continue to reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and reduce greenhouse gases. Social impact is very important. So we see ourselves as a community. Uh, we see ourselves as a leader in the market space, and we need to continue to have this embedded into our DNA. So we continue to work on philanthropic initiatives where we work with local communities. We work with our employees. Uh, we focus on in initiatives that are tangible for impact and long-term effects. Uh, you know, and as a whole, we're responsible for creating a, a trusted and healthy workplace. So we look at that social component. We want to make sure that the individuals we work with don't face discrimination. We want to make sure that they have fair wages, but we also want to create learning experiences for folks to continue to climb in the positions that they are today. So it's with that and the caring of each other's well-being that we can continue to respect all aspects of diversity. So let's get into the nuts and bolts of why we're doing what we're doing. And a lot of that is deemed on legislation, decarbonization and consumer understanding. And this is what moves us forward. So everyone is fairly aware of the, the United Nations 17 goals to transform our world. And in large part, this is where all the decarbonization efforts have come into place. The decarbonization efforts really come from all of us focusing on environmental, social and governance. And where we need to focus and where we're actively involved is the impacts that we have on land, the impacts we have on water. But we also need to work with number 17, which is basically it's a partnership for the goals. So it's in these discussions that we help to evolve these partnerships. It's in these discussions that we start to build collaborative spirits and we start to develop that transformative approach. And it's in that transformative approach that we encourage all of us to rethink how we design, produce, consume, and dispose of the goods that we develop and market. So talking about commitments to reducing our carbon footprint, you know, along with the 17 goals that have been initiated by the United Nations, you know, there's the Paris Agreement, the Paris Accord. And within this agreement, that set out a global framework to avoid dangerous climate change by limiting the global warming to two degrees Celsius or one, you know, or, or at least pushing the efforts to limit 1.5 degrees Celsius year over year. And so the aim is to strengthen countries' ability to deal with the impacts of climate change. So just with that, AMCO and our parent company, Rivago, have made the effort to say that we're going to at minimum shoot to re reduce our carbon or carbon outputs by at least a minimum of 4.2% year over year. And it's with that 4.2% that we believe as an industry, as producers, that we can keep that global warming down to 1.5 degrees Celsius. So if we started our commission or our, our commitment in 2020, and so the goal is over the next 10 years to try and reach full decarbonization net zero. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that that's very difficult because we're still fundamentally understanding, you know, what our scope emissions are going to be. And we'll talk about those emissions shortly. As a whole, though, the vast majority of the emissions that we are responsible for are what we would consider scope three. These are things that are out of our control. What we need to understand, though, is that the reason why this is moving forward. So, you know, if we reduce our emissions by 4.2 percent year over year from 2020 to 2030, at very minimum, our goal as an organization is to have 42 percent reduction over the, the, the next 10 years. With that, what we're seeing in 2023, it's kind of a, a landmark event in that financial institutions. And so if we think about the financial capital, the, the capital that's out there from a, a uh, availability for funding purposes, nearly 41 percent of that capital that's available in the market space that's controlled by a small percentage of banks. All of these banks have taken the initiative to say that if you are working on decarbonization or if you're not working on decarbonization efforts, what will happen is that that's going to be used as a lever 
for future funding for financial purposes. So this is why this is coming to such a strong head right now, where we need to be cognizant about our emissions. We need to be cognizant about the materials that we're choosing to move forward because they play a huge impact. If we can go back one slide, guys. So talking about these scope emissions, scope one and scope two, these are things that are controlled by our organizations. So as a manufacturer, you, the energy that you use to power your heating and cooling, uh, the energy that's utilized to power the trucks that you guys drive that are company corporate owned. Most individuals in this market space have sort of moved through, or not sort of, but have already started to move through their scope one and scope two emissions. And what we're finding is that anywhere between 70 and 90% of the emissions that we have to work to reduce are actually scope three. Scope three is probably one of the most challenging locations to reduce those em emissions, largely because we're still working on life cycle analysis. We're still working on product carpet footprint information. The good news is, is that we are making in, you know, immense strides pushing this forward. We're making great strides in finding ways to, to provide life cycle analysis, global warming potential, you know, looking at the resources that we use to make this. And AMCO as a whole, nearly 80% of the emissions, we believe, and again, this is a generalized term because we're still formulating, is related to even the delivery systems, you know, as a distributor, as a producer. The, the transit systems that we utilize can account for about 80% of our emissions. Now, converters, folks that are doing injection molding, extrusion, extrusion below molding, a lot of their emissions are related to the materials that they bring in. And it's the, the building blocks that they are not involved in that actually have the greatest impacts on carbon impact or carbon output. So these are things that we're starting to work on, and this is why we're here trying to define the technology so you guys can make the choice on what materials are going to give you the best overall scope reductions, scope three for that matter. So with that, there's the legislative process. And so just as just a brief overview, and this information was provided to us and we gained from the American Chemistry Council. But this is something that a lot of folks are very interested in from a specifier perspective. So in 2023, you know, these states are states that either have proposed or enacted extended producer responsibility. So what's extended producer responsibility? And in extended producer responsibility, it's it's a legislative effort in which organizations are going to be responsible for putting recycled content or lowering their carbon output by choosing materials that come from recycled sources. Those laws are varying. I mean, we have lots of laws that are varying. There's a lot of different levers that they're considering where there could be potential fines by not choosing the right material. Um, there could be other repercussions that happen depending upon whether or not you reach mandatory minimum recycled content requirements in those specific states. That being said, though, this is just a good indicator that we need to be cognizant of the materials that we're choosing and how we're moving forward in the market space. So we need to continue to keep an eye on what's happening in these environments. What I can tell you is that legislation continues to be somewhat clear as mud, largely because there's infighting at the local municipalities and the state municipalities and as well with federal lawmakers. Moving forward, we continue to lobby and we continue to push these technologies forward, and we're doing what we can to give a better definition of what we see. What we can say, though, with this is that it's important for you to be aware that there is legislation coming down the pipeline that's going to drive a lot of the decisions we move forward. First and foremost, they're going to hit on packaging and packaging for goods, which is probably one of the more easy things to see at this point in time. As we continue to move forward and things progress, this is going to be specific to designed parts and components that are manufactured. Next slide. So this just goes into packaging restrictions and you know we all manufacture parts and we have to put them into packaging. So as you can see, this map continues to expand. Um, you know, there's 20 plus states that have packaging restrictions on the books. And what's going to happen is that we are all going to be held accountable in order to keep the packaging that we have our goods in uh, in a sustainable level. So we need to be able to propose these technologies. We need to be able to offer these technologies and we need to be forward thinking now so that we don't get into a reactive situation where we have product out there actively in the market space and then you get challenged by a legislative body. So it's important to understand where these restrictions are but this is just gives you an idea, a pictorial view of what we see in the market space today. So currently there's multiple different types of recycled content legislation that's out there. Um, you know, in the purple, these are mandatory laws. So these are mandatory minimum recycled content where they're asking for anywhere between uh, 20% uh, all the way to 35% 
minimum recycled content. There's other states that are pushing for 50% mandatory minimum recycled content. And it's with this that, this that we have to be ready and prepared to present materials that are acceptable in that market space. And it's in understanding these particular technologies that we need to be able to choose the right technology that works for our applications. So in the mobility market space, there's a lot of challenges. We need to require outstanding physical properties. You know, packaging in general is somewhat simplistic in that it doesn't go through the same rigors that a, a mobility market space application goes through, whether it's UV stability, heat resistance, color specific requirements. And these are all things that we need to focus on multiple different subsets of technologies to meet. Beyond that, these extended producer laws, what we're pushing to or pushing for as an industry leader is that we want industry professionals involved in these technologies. We want to make sure that these will be available um, to the, the, the market spaces that we work in, but we have a lever where we can actually control some of these technologies. So this is why we're trying to get out in front of it right now, so that not only is it a legislative body that's setting these, these specific laws, but we also wanna make sure that we are involved in those decisions to help set those standards. And if we don't get out in front of it as an industry as a whole, we're gonna be kind of left behind while we're having legislators who don't understand the technologies making the laws that guide how we move forward as a market space. So again, there's proposed mandates, there is uh, proposed non-mandates for, for extended producer responsibility. As this ma map evolves, we'll continue to update it. And, and this will be available to the rest of the market space. Um, you know, this presentation that we have for you will be available because you are a participant within this specific discussion. Next slide. So this is where the, the, the crux of the, the presentation that we're going to focus on, and we have to focus on building the pathway to sustainability. And it's in building this pathway. So I like to use pathway as a term, largely because there's always multiple pathways to get to the end result. You know, we can take multiple different directions to get from Los Angeles to New York. There's multiple routes, there's different scenic routes, there's different things that we can do to make choices along the way. And it's with that that we as an organization have to be able to build a pathway with specific building blocks for each individualized organization. You know, IKEA is going to have different standards than Ford is going to have. So in that, we have to have multiple technologies available to us. And then beyond that, we also have to be accountable and we have to have tracking systems and certification processes so that we can ensure you as the customer and consumer and specifier and designer can make claims specifically on these materials. So all of these little radio buttons here, I would consider are building materials. And it's, you know, just as we go to Home Depot and Lowe's to go purchase materials to make a pathway, these are different types of building blocks and different types of substrates and different types of additives that we can make a unique pathway for our customers. And it's in that differentiated approach where we can deliver with multiple different technologies to get you to your sustainability or decarbonization efforts. So not only do we need to be able to deliver post-industrial, post-consumer, biodegradable, bio-based circularity programs, we also have to focus on the packaging and the delivery systems that we utilize. We need to have a streamlined, focused delivery system because not only do we need to give you carbon reduction in the materials, but we also need to give you carbon reduction in reducing miles to delivery. Because it doesn't make sense for us to ship stuff from the United States to the opposite side of the world because the amount of energy that it takes to get there basically negates all of our decarbonization efforts. So we need to take a look at this from a holistic approach. And it's with that we have to be involved in industry associations and organizations and educate in the, the, the formats that we're doing today like ISCC, which stands for International International Society or International Sustainability Carbon Credit Certification, or, or, or the American Plastics Recycling Committee, or Plastics Industry, or Hospital or Healthcare Plastics Recycling Council. These are all things that we have to be involved with to keep a pulse of what's going on. And so it's with these industry involvements that we're able to present information like this because we have this collaborative spirit for sharing information. So from that, we, we have all these building blocks, right? What we need to do is we need, need to start to classify these into buckets. And this is where we start to kind of condense the menu. So instead of walking into Starbucks and having 100,000 different choices of choosing which direction to go, we can classify these technologies into buckets. And this is what we're trying to do as an organization. This is why we're trying to make and shape the market space by defining the technologies and putting them into consumable buckets. And with that, we start with the post-consumer recycled materials. You know, that's always going to be first and foremost. Beyond that, there's the post-industrial recycled materials that we're actively involved with. 
bioattributed mass balance polymerize is very important where a lot of the market space is focusing today and advanced molecular recycling needs to be a part. We're all actively involved in intelligent design and everything that we do, but there's multiple ways and different changes in the materials that we utilize that we can we could start with. So it's with these five buckets, though, there's a cadence that we need to follow. And first and foremost, when we talk about transformative approach, we all need to kind of take a back seat and sit down and rethink for a moment how we design the products that we put into the applications that we create today. And first and foremost, the most efficient way to reduce carbon, but then also to save waste from going into landfills is to choose and try and design with post-consumer recycled materials. We'll move forward in the, in the presentation on defining these particular technologies, but keep in mind, so if we choose post-consumer, we can see a potential reduction. And again, this is only potential because life cycle analysis continues to be pending on different technologies, but we can see a net reduction in, in, in the range of 80% carbon if you choose a post-consumer recycled material versus a standard prime finite sourced light petroleum feed stream material. Post-industrial recycle, again, still needs a lot of defining. You know, post-industrial plays a factor in the advanced recycling, and we'll talk about that a little bit further. But the next step that we would choose in the advancements of, of choosing materials, if a post-consumer material doesn't work, we would move towards a bioattributed mass balance product. Reason being is with these particular products is that we're using, uh, you know, waste cooking oil or methane or um, biosourced feedstocks in which we can build and actually create bioattributed naphtha, which is the fundamental building blocks of most, most materials, and then in turn turn those into products that actually have the same physical properties, same identities as your standard prime materials that you're using today. The great thing is, is that depending upon how much bioattributed feedstock that we utilize, we can create a 100% carbon neutral material. And with that, we don't sacrifice color, we don't sacrifice physical properties, we don't sacrifice any of the, the regulatory body information that's already around those particular materials. So we'll get into that a little bit further, but it's great for people to understand that this is the cadence that we should start to follow. And then last but not least, the number three material that we would look at is the advanced molecular recycling. Advanced molecular recycling, what it does is it allows us to take mixed waste. You know, It can be a mixture of polystyrene, polypropylene, and polyethylene. And we can still convert those additives into pyrolytic oil that can be used as the, the building blocks for, for ethylene, uh, naphtha, um, and then into bioattributed materials. And these advanced molecular recycling technologies, albeit they're still evolving, we still have a lot of pending life cycle analysis and we still have yet to hit the fullest uh, phase. But the great thing about it that advanced recycling does is it still helps to recapture some of these waste products that go to landfill. Uh, Bioattributed, kind of moving one step backwards into number two, the reason why it would be number two versus number one post-consumer is because bioattributed is not taking these waste products that are going into landfills and recapturing them. They're taking other sources that are not finite supply, and there are waste products that we are collecting and helping to contribute to decarbonization. But first and foremost, we always want to look to post-consumer first. And then if that does not work, then we have the ability to go to bioattributed mass balance or advanced molecular recycle materials. Next slide. So in that, this is where the collaborative spirit comes with AMCO. And AMCO, what I like to say is that we are an agnostic material supplier, but it's in that independence that we develop relationships with industry leaders in technology and industry leaders in post-consumer recycled, post-industrial recycled, bioattributed, and advanced molecular recycling. And this is through these partnerships that we're able to present these advancements in the technologies, but also then choose the right materials for your applications. So we're not stuck to one specific subject or one specific material matter. We have the ability to work with everything from polypropylene all the way up to peak. So we think about that polymer pyramid, we can work on the amorphous and we can work on the crystalline, semi-crystalline side, and we can work from the bottom all the way to the top. And it's in that we can choose materials that are specific to your needs, but there is no application that we can't tackle today. And the great thing is that these technologies are commercially available. We have material that we can supply and give to you and support the needs that you guys have today. Next slide. So one other point is that, you know, we need to look at the claims that we do on these particular materials. And a lot of folks hear a lot about ISCC plus. And so what is ISCC plus and what are these certifying bodies? ISCC, which is you know, the International Society of Carbon Certification, essentially is an independent 
auditing system that we subscribe to. Uh, Amco, a Revago company, is covered under ISCC Plus. So what this means is that we can work with our producer partners that have ISCC Plus certified materials. And what that means is that we can track from the inception of these recycled content products all the way through to the fruition of polymerization, through the delivery process, the distribution system. And then when we get product to your floor, we can show that chain of custody from inception to fruition. And it's with that, then in turn, so instead of just saying, hi, Mr. Mrs. Customer or consumer, we use recycled materials, what we can say is now you can claim percentages. You can say that we took 5% post-industrial recycled feedstock or post-consumer recycled feedstock or 50% uh, bio-attributed feedstocks. And it's through this independent auditing that you then, through the court of law, can give a sound number of our product contains 50% recycled content or mixed waste circular additive. And it's through the certification body that you have the ability to make physical claims on your products. Now, if you are challenged after the life cycle of your application, or if you are challenged while you're producing products, it's through these certifications and the ability to show that chain of custody, chain of command from inception to fruition to when you make it on your floor, that you can prove that it has all the backup evidence that's there. What I do have to recommend is that it is important with this that customers and consumers and producers consider going through this certification as well, because it's with that then you can certify through your process that it wasn't changed out with a prime material or wasn't changed out with an alternative. This shows that tracking mechanism so that you can make those physical end user claims. So now let's kind of focus on the, the the meat of what we're looking at today. You know, let's talk about the technologies that are there. So I'm sure everyone that's on this call today uh, or within this webinar understands somewhat what post-consumer recycled materials are or mechanically recycled. So post-consumer as a definition are, are materials that are discarded into waste streams. They're, they're destined for landfills. So they're consumer products that have reached end of life or they're mobility products that have basically gone to the junkyard. They are land and ocean derived, and it's important to understand that we can't just take these materials and just throw them back in the process. They have to be mechanically recycled. They have to be separated. They have to be segregated. And in that, what happens is that you get differentiated levels of quality. So keep in mind, you're not going to be able to use these materials for every application because the molecular weight of the material is dropped or diminished because it's gone through processing phases. And as it gets refined and, and put back into systems, it also starts to lose molecular weight over the life cycle. So with that, you know, because of there's different mixed streams, there's limited natural color availability. You know, we as an organization are working on several announcements. We have an announcement that's probably going to be coming out in the month of July where we're going to be able to announce a very large capacity of natural post-consumer recycled feedstocks. We're not there yet to kind of give all those disclosures, but kind of keep your eyes and ears open for some announcements coming down the pipeline very soon, where we're going to be able to address the supply capacities and the limitations that are there. So in most of these products, they tend to be dark colors, typically black. Um, keep in mind, because of the reduction in molecular weight, they usually have lower properties versus prime. There's a high demand because consumers fully understand post-consumer. They don't understand the other technologies as yet. But we can also take these products and we can mix them. So as supply is limited, it's going to be important for us to develop different mixtures and different ratios to put into our products so that we can continue to move forward and advance in these products. With that, mixing virgin materials with the regrind or the post-consumer allows us to have better physical properties. And then also, last but not least, there's a cost versus quality balance. So usually the more cost you see on that material, the more evolved it is, the more engineering that goes in there. And this is why we're seeing pricing deltas on post-consumer surpassing that of standard prime materials. I mean, keep in mind, making polypropylene and polyethylene is very cheap. And that's why we don't have as many options available in the market space, because it's very cheap for us to manufacture polypropylene, polystyrene, and polyethylene. So with that, you know, there's new technologies that are emerging. And as interest continues to move forward, we're starting to see introductions of FDA formulated products. Uh, we're starting to see that supply chain extend as we're getting a better understanding of what's there. So availability is starting to become better. But with this, we need to keep in mind that we, has to, we have to have this transformative approach. 
if we're not thinking transformatively, it's going to be difficult for us to say, well, you know what? I've got a, a nylon 6'6", 30% glass fill product, but I have all of these criteria. We really need to take a look at those criteria and start to make adjustments or take a look at making design modifications, either in thickness or radius to where we can perform better. And it's through that transformative approach that we can really start to come up with solutions and get better improved decarbonization or reduction in greenhouse gases moving forward. Next slide. So we talked a little bit about post-industrial recycled. Just want to let everyone know that Amco, Rivago, you know, we have heavy investments in the post-industrial recycled polymers market space. Again, it's still not fully understand by legislative bodies, but this plays a critical role, though, in what's available in the market space because we can take these post-industrial materials so we can claim that they are recycled content. We can't call them post-consumer, but we can call them post-industrial. And it's with these post-industrial materials that we're taking something that was going to be a waste byproduct and turning it back into something. Whether it's being put, you know, taking nylon carpet or carpet fiber, carpet yarns, and then converting them in our facility in Manchester, Tennessee, you know, that has the ability to do 80 plus million pounds per year in nylon six and six six in a recycled content format. Um, these materials are also being utilized as feedstocks in the other technologies, advanced molecular technologies, to boost the physical properties or to boost the quality of the pyrolytic oils that we use that we get from uh, uh, advanced molecular recycling to create other polymers. So they have their role and they're there, it's, but it's also important for us to understand, well, what can we claim, what we can use? And in these particular products, the advantage with post-industrial is that they're more controlled, so we have more natural availability. Um, you know, th there's better consistency than post-consumer. And it's with this that we find a way to create combinations of materials so that we can meet the demand because there's limited supplies with other products. Next slide. So with this, we move forward more to the advanced technology. So, you know, the vast majority of the supplier partners that Amco works with are using mass balance approach, but they're doing it with either advanced molecular recycling or bioattributed mass balance polymerization. And it's understanding this technology that can be somewhat challenging. So just like we want to reduce our scope one and scope two emissions, we would subscribe to green technologies or purchase green energies. That generates green credits. The energies that we have coming into our facilities, though, aren't necessarily 100% dedicated to wind power, solar power, uh, biomass supplied energies. In a lot of cases, we're still getting coal powered or natural gas powered energies, but it's with those purchases of those energies that we buy those green credits. And it's with this, we can produce materials on the same capital investments, so the polymer production facilities, the existing facilities that are there are actively integrating green feedstocks, whether they come from an advanced molecular recycled chemical or they come from a bioattributed methane. These particular products are being inserted into the existing production facilities that we have. So number one, it doesn't require extra capital investment into production facilities, but what it does do is it capitalizes on these facilities that we have today, and we can input these into the system because these green feedstocks that we're using have no molecular difference than the standard fundamental building blocks that we use to make standard polymers today. And it's with that that we know that we put, for example, 400 metric tons of methane feedstock into our production facility. And we know that's gonna yield, for example, don't quote me on the numbers, uh, uh, you know, a million pounds of acetal. But it's with that understanding of what we're putting in that we can do dedicated segregated bookkeeping to account for the material that we've produced because once it goes through that production facility, it's mixing with conventional feedstocks. And the fact of the matter is, is that the products that you are using today, whether it's polycarbonate, whether it's acetal, whether it's polyethylene, are more than likely already being mixed with these green feedstocks. You're just not paying for the credits or you're not receiving the credits for those technologies. And in a lot of cases, it can be a variable understanding of anywhere between 5% to 100% bioattributed or advanced molecular recycled chemicals that have been used to, to, to make that polymer, but it's only through this dedicated certification system that we can say that you're actually getting what you're getting. So we can't tell the difference when it comes out the end producer end, we can't segregate the green products from the non-green products. All we can do is basically say that we have stored credits for the production of X amount of material that are going to be going to customer A, B, C, or D. And it's that through that approach that we can then basically say that you can claim that you have a 97% bioattributed product because you paid for those specific credits in this particular material. And it's with the certifications and the self declarations that come with those products in which you guys can make those claims moving forward. So let's talk a little bit more about the materials and the properties that they have. 
So this is where we see a lot of the advancements. I mean, early on, um, this is where the technologies have kind of proven their worth immensely. And the vast majority of the suppliers that we work with, the most prevalent technology that we're seeing today is bioattributed mass balance polymerization. And what I can say is that, you know, in a matter of 12 months, we went from roughly 86 products to tens of thousands of products that we can choose. And it's with that that we can wholeheartedly say that there is no application that we cannot meet the physical demands on. It's through these technologies, bioattributed and advanced molecular design technologies, in which we yield the same products that we produce today. The only difference is, is that the source that we get those feedstocks from are either bioattributed or post-consumer recycled or post-industrial recycled feedstocks. And with that, there's different bioattributed resources. So we can get them from cooking oil. And what do we mean by cooking oil? You know, McDonald, Wendy's, Burger King, Taco Bell, wherever you're, 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 you're eating fast food from, they generate waste cooking oil. And it's with that waste cooking oil that we can take that was basically going to be discarded and break that back down to fundamental building blocks. We can turn that into bioattributed naphtha, bioattributed benzene, convert that to bioattributed phenol, turn that to bioattributed bisphenol, and then bisphenol, all of a sudden you have polycarbonate. And it's with that that we, we can produce these products that have yields uh, of nearly anywhere between 25% to 100% bioattribution, but the CO2 reduction can be anywhere from 25% all the way up to 100% carbon neutral scenarios. Uh, it's because these particular technologies, they don't use the same energy to convert. And the great news is that we can't tell the difference. So from a specifier perspective, when we get bioattributed naphtha, it's no different than standard produced naphtha that came from finite crude oil supplies. Just as we can't tell the difference from feedstocks that come from crude oil that comes from Venezuela or crude oil that comes from North American sands oil, the constituent building blocks, if we break it down to the molecular level, are the same. So from a fingerprint perspective, we can't tell the difference from one to the other. And the great thing is that, that these identical fingerprints yield prime property products. And with that, regulatory bodies have wholeheartedly supported that this product is no different than the standard product. So in some cases, it requires no requalification. Granted, that's a difficult term to get by because our customers, because we have a nomenclature change, they're going to want to see that process. They're going to want to see that, that part approvals process, the PPAP. Um, but at the end of the day, what we can say is that wholeheartedly, you will not sacrifice process. You will not sacrifice physical properties. You will not have any differentiations in the materials that you utilize. And you can then fundamentally choose a product that gives you carbon reduction right out of the gate. You know, what are the negatives that come along with it? Well, these processes and these technologies, as they become adapted, there's a cost associated with. But what we are seeing is that the early initiators that are taking the initiative to start working with these materials are getting beneficial pricing. You know, the early initiators have the ability to lead the market space. And with that, you start to refine your messaging and your technology to have differential advantages versus your competition. Let's move forward to the advanced recycling because there's more to add there. So. With advanced molecular recycling, same technology, same idea as the bioattributed, uh, but again, the, we're getting these feedstocks from waste products. And in turn, we can use these products in an infinite loop again and again and again, because we're breaking these base materials down to the fundamental building blocks of what they're created from. So I'm gonna, we're gonna share a video from one of our supplier partners. These items may look ordinary, but hidden inside their composition is a story about how human ingenuity made our lives better and how that same ingenuity is about to help our planet. Plastic has a profound influence on our everyday life. In countless ways, it makes how we live possible. But unmanaged plastic waste is not acceptable and must be addressed. We all have to stop thinking of plastic as disposable not just because this attitude is bad for the environment, but because plastic is simply too valuable to throw away. Today's recycling options allow us to repurpose and reuse plastic, but not without limitations. Advanced recycling, also known as chemical recycling, changes everything. This process converts post-use plastic into raw materials that are indistinguishable from original polymers Advanced recycling turns plastic waste into a liquid 
which strips away impurities and upgrades it into a usable raw material that can be converted into monomers and new circular polymers, like polyethylene. The technology has many important advantages. It allows us to take used plastic molecules, which would otherwise be lost, and give them a second life, a third, a fourth, and more. It works for a variety of plastics, even hard to recycle items like plastic films and complex packaging. And because it's chemically identical to brand new polymers, it's clean and safe for food, pharmaceutical, and medical grade applications. Put simply, advanced recycling is a revolutionary innovation that can turn a used piece of plastic into a new material again and again and again. Chevron Phillips Chemical is pioneering this technology and collaborating with other industry leaders to drive progress. Together, we're building a more circular economy and contributing to a sustainable future. At Chevron Phillips Chemical, we're proud to be part of this solution. Let's go change the world. So with that, some key points to understand is that, again, as we mentioned earlier, the properties of these particular products are identical to brand new plastics. There's identical safety, identical regulatory. The product specifications are the same as virgin materials. And so this, what we need for everyone to understand is that the waste that we generate as a industry and the waste that we industry generate as a consumer is too valuable to let go to the waste now that we can recycle these feedstocks, now that we can pull these back in. So we're also going to talk a little bit about technology that our, our other supplier partners, Sabic, uses in their Elkrin IQ PPT products. And it, again, this is considered an advanced molecular recycling in which we take post-consumer waste PET bottles and we clean, flake, segregate them, break them down into a more usable process. And then through a depolymerization phase, we break them down into the fundamental building block for PET to use in PBT production. And just as we showed in the previous slides for mass balance polymerization, we're adding in the standard finite supply fossil fuels and they're mixing together, yielding a product that has the same physical properties as a standard Velox PPT for that matter. So again, just understanding that this particular technology it goes through a chemical reversible process. And so what we like to say is upcycling. We don't like to call it chemical recycling because that's somewhat of a curse word because people get scared when they hear chemical. So that's why we would like to say advanced recycling or advanced molecular recycling. But it's through this depolymerization decomposition that we can create like a pyrolytic oil or a base fundamental material to create standard prime products. And it's with that that we've got the ability to have a solution that's there. And this is a technology that's been available for not just a year, it's been available for many years, and we're finding our feet right now with these particular technologies. So last but not least, you know, intelligent design, you know, we need to find a way to, to process better. In some cases, we can make decisions on materials where the material doesn't require drying, reduces energy. We can look at light weighting that we've all been actively involved with, but that light weighting does reduce the amount of polymer footprint, carbon footprint in that we're using less material to make more parts. Um, with that, we still have a lot of evolution to move forward with life cycle analysis, and we are working with industry experts to help develop these technologies to understand what our carbon footprints are going to be moving forward. And then in turn, we need to look at single use applications and turn them into multi use applications. So choosing a material that has better durability, better longevity is very important. So last but not least, I kind of want to leave you guys with this and again. I apologize, but this is very rudimentary, but we have to start somewhere. So we have to start guiding folks through these buckets and these decision-making processes. And obviously, first and foremost, we wanna look at post-consumer recycled. Keep in mind that there's limitations that are there. Uh, there's different chain of custodies and certification processes, but what you'll get is you'll get a PDF of this after this whole session ends to where you can at least utilize, it, utilize this in your daily decision-making of, can I choose something? What I wanna leave everyone with though, is that number one, Today, because of the advancements in post-consumer recycled, post-industrial, bio-attributed, and advanced molecular recycling, and intelligent design for the matter, there is no application that we cannot be challenged with today in which we cannot supply a sustainable solution. And what you'll find as a precursor as we move forward on the slides is that from a teaser perspective, 
what we're going to jump into in the next session is actually designing for these applications. And you'll find with these particular technologies, we have multiple solutions available to deliver into these applications. So it's not going to just be one singular material. We might be able to put a post consumer or a bio attributed or advanced molecular or a post industrial or an intelligent design material. But today, more so than ever, these technologies are available for you and for your utilization. Next slide. So again, as a teaser, what we'll do is the next phase, we're going to have several segments within and we're going to talk about materials for choice for exterior, interior, EV battery, charging stations, and we'll have suggestions for you and we'll specifically call out individualized applications that may be of interest for you and for your organization. Next slide. So again, what I want to leave you with is that now that we have somewhat of a fundamental understanding of the technologies, there is no application that we can't come up with a solution for. The question is whether or not that's price sensitive, if it's cost sensitive. There's ways that we can work on blended ratios to, to make that sense. If it's a difference of 40 cents per pound, if you put it in at 10%, that 40 cents per pound becomes 4 cents per pound. Uh, if, if, you, if you have challenges that are there, there's multiple ways that we can build into these technologies. So challenge us, you know, reach out to myself, reach out to Bob, reach out to Bruce, reach out to your individual AMCO seller. We're here to support you, but it's through this collaborative, transformative approach that we're going to make a difference and we're going to help you build an individualized pathway to sustainability. And with that, we'll kind of open it up to questions. Thanks, Adam. Um, again, if you have any questions, you can type them in the Q&A tab at the top. First question I see, great info. Will the slides be available to us as a PowerPoint? The answer to that is yes. All registered guests will get a copy of the presentation as well as a link to the recording uh, as well so you can share it with your colleagues. Uh, number two, our industry is doing a good job currently with the carbon emissions scope one and two. Can you explain how you can help us move forward to scope three? Adam? Yeah, so th this is something when we talked about scope three emissions that that is really where the challenging is. And so the markets are being pushed for, for carbon disclosure projects, CDP. And Mobility may not be moving at the same pace as healthcare or consumer goods, but it's something that's going to be coming down the pipeline. So we as an industry are working on different life cycle analysis where we can talk about global warming potential or, or product carbon footprints, not only with our suppliers, but also with our own products that we produce and generate on a daily basis. And what I can tell you is that there are significant advancements that are being made by our producer partners and through our organization as a whole to give you guys tangible information, such as we can find standardized studies that have been supplied by the American Chemistry Council, where we at least have a baseline to start with. And with that baseline, then what we can do is we can take the product carbon footprints of these materials. Now, granted, we still have a ways to go with some of the commodity materials, polystyrene, polyethylene, uh, polypropylene, but the ETP products, the engineering thermal plastics, a lot of our supplier partners that are present, and some of them are on the call with us today, have product carbon footprints that have been individualized. For instance, if you take a standard ABS and you convert it into a sustainable 50% mechanically recycled product that we have that we offer through Enio Styrolution, we know that we can see a 47% reduction in carbon by choosing that product and making a one-for-one -one change. We have to understand the, the limitations. We have to think about this transformatively, but the great news is that we can start to develop the, the, the discussion to where when we are forced to do carbon disclosures, which could possibly happen in 2024, we will start to have that data that we can feed into that system so we can start to report the reductions that we can build into those products. Great. Uh, next question. Can you tell me how these products are going to be priced? Our customers as of yet are not willing to pay more for sustainability. Yeah, so that's that's something that we see first and foremost. Before we even get into discussing the buckets of what these materials are, the first question on every mind is, what's it going to cost me? Well, how can I implement this? You know, we as a market and as an industry, we are, we are coming down from COVID high pricing. And the reason why I say COVID high pricing is because we had all these supply constraints during that process. So coming down from that perspective and then trying to implement a technology that costs more can be somewhat daunting. What we need everyone to understand is that, as we mentioned earlier, is that the early initiators that are taking that step, taking that leap forward and thinking transformatively are getting beneficial treatment. So today, more than ever, there's no time better than now to start thinking about these applications. 
The concern is, though, is that most folks just didn't understand the technologies. So now we can start to fundamentally talk about the benefits that these technologies can offer. We can talk about what the value stream is going to be. And now that there's a bigger globalized picture of understanding how this is going to put us in standing, we're starting to be judged by our customers by our decarbonization efforts. We're starting to be judged by our customers and our sustainability efforts. And it's with that being a leader in that market space is beneficial to us in that we get early integration. We get early rights to see what these technologies are. So it's with those specific integrations that we're going to start to see some cost reductions. I mean, as of right now, we're seeing costs go back and forth. And now recycled content is almost to the point where it's more expensive than the standard prime materials because it's in such high demand. And it's with that Amco Polymers, we offer multiple technologies. That's why we have to have post-consumer recycle, post-industrial, bio-attributed, advanced molecular recycle, and other intelligent designs like compostable, biodegradable materials so that we can meet those demands because there still is finite supply that's out there. With that, though, we are seeing advantageous pricing available to folks that are willing to take that leap forward with us. And we're willing to work on your behalf to establish that. So whatever those matrix are. And then when we get down to that granular level on that piece part cost, the differential could be insignificant if we really break it down to that granular level. So that's what we're here for to help you guys out. We're help you to, here to help you choose materials that make sense for your applications. We have the know-how and the knowledge base to where we're just not going to talk about the technologies themselves. We're going to be able to choose the ones that we know that are going to work in your process with limited modifications to what your needs are so that you can still meet those high standards for your customers. And beyond that, we're willing to come in and break things down into fundamental bites and fundamental pieces so that we can help you through the process, the design, the, the sourcing, the pricing, everything that goes behind it. We are a full service organization so that we can develop circular solutions. So whether or not you're creating waste products, whether these products that are going to be discarded, if we want to recapture them and turn them into something else, that's where we're building new pathways today too as well, is that we're here to give you a circular solution. So not only are we giving you circular polymers, we're giving you materials that develop a circular approach beyond the manufacturing that you do on your end. Great. Thanks, Adam. I'm looking at the time here. We're buttoned up on our hour. Uh, I don't see any more questions. So with that, I want to wrap up. Thank everyone for your time. Greatly appreciate it. And also remind you, <clears throat> by registering just for webinar one, you're not automatically registered for webinars two and three. So watch for your emails and uh, you'll be able to register. Number two is going to be very exciting. We're going to get into actual applications and actual material grades and talk about you know, design suggestions, things like that. So hopefully we see you all next time. Other than that, and, thank you and have a great day. And keep with that, there's no limitation on the amount of, of attendees that we can offer. So uh, invite your friends, invite your co colleagues. <laughs> We're here to support you guys further. Um, and this is where we'll start to build down and actually specifically depict applications and what materials would be wise to choose and what benefits you gain from it. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.